So you are listening to Achieve Spiritual, Holistic, and Self-Improvement Radio. And today our guest is Courtney Marcasani. She has been a yoga instructor. She is also a certified Alaska flower essence practitioner. I'm looking down as I read this, guys, um, because I don't want to make my little screen up in the middle. And she also integrates nutrition. And she has uh, a very interesting life. You, where do you live now? I'm in Anchorage, Alaska, but uh, I'm originally from Pennsylvania, northeastern Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Do your roots go back into Pennsylvania? Oh, yeah. They're, all my family is still in northeastern Pennsylvania. And in fact, my mom, uh, my father has passed away now, but my mom is still on the family farm. It's a hundred year old or wow. century farm that's been passed down from my grandmother my grandmother's side of the family and so i would be like the fifth or sixth generation so have you always been intuitive i didn't know that i was but oh. i think i can answer that i probably was but just not consciously aware of it until i got in my mid-20s and then when i was in my mid-20s i had a series of profound transpersonal or transformative experiences that were totally based out of my intuition and they were a couple of them were pretty life-saving they helped save not only my life but my daughter's life other people my friends and so those experiences really led me to understand it and to dive into it and figure it out like what so is it is that the nucleus of your book what got you uh, your yeah. last book can so tell me about that the last book that was recently published by Hay House called Four Gifts of the Highly Even Sensitive. Lucky dog. <laughs> I, I worked hard at it. Luck favors the prepared, darling. <laughs> so, that's like that's like the prima donna that every every psychic wants to get into. But, uh, I know. I know it is. And I worked lucky. really hard. You know, I, I tried to actually just backstory on the book. I tried to get in with them for years almost 10 years and they rejected a proposal that I sent in early like in 2012 but I still had them in my sights and so I developed the concept for this book over time and, and kind of fine-tuned it more and more and then they finally accepted it in 2018 I won the writer's workshop award so that allowed me a publishing deal with them and so awesome. it was literally a dream come true but I worked really hard to get it and I zeroed in on them and focused um, but it's the culmination of like 20 years of research from that first initial like opening psychic awareness or intuitive profound intuitive experiences when I started looking for books to un explain or so I could understand what was going on with me and so this book is literally the book I was looking for when I was in my mid-20s trying to find <laughs> that's the way to do it is it you yeah it was trying to like for. how do i write this for people and then i said to myself well this is the book that i would have loved to have found when i was searching on my journey so tell me about it the title is again as she lifts up her four book. gifts of the highly sensitive the four gifts are intuition empathy vision and expression. There are basically four types of patterns of personality traits that I noticed in gifted sensitives. So it's, it's, it's defines what sensitivity is, but then it goes into these personality types that are basically, um, they develop, these individuals find a way to develop their sensitivity gifts into abilities. And I go can into you, that. Can you give me a, a little bit of a rundown? Sure. Of, of the, the four types? Yeah, people. sure. The intuitives are the ones that are able to process information from their unconscious or what they're not consciously aware of with a, a, a lightning fast speed. So they have uh, the ability to find answers to questions suddenly, quickly, without usually rationalization or logic or intellectualism. They're Can not... May I Go ask ahead. you a question about that? Do you think additional? De I call it. I've always had ADD, which is additional. I call additional dimension disorder. Um, so I'm wondering, and I have heard from others. Uh, Laura Day, 
uh, who is, you know, she says that she's had a lifelong problem with being ADD. And I wondered, if, is that a common trait of any of those? Yes, it is. And I go, into that, I go into that in the book and the reasons why, right? And how these different things express themselves through attention, arousal, perception, perceptive anomalies, or things that are kind of exceptional that most people do not experience. And so ADD and ADHD is part of that. It is interesting because I guess it's about 5% of the population experiences ADD or ADHD and there's extremes, right? There's extremes on the ADD and ADHD scale. So the way it works in the sensitivity umbrella, right, for attention is people who are extremely sensitive are attending to sensory stimulation in their environment. When you become so sensitive, lights, sounds, feelings, um, things that are coming into your senses do distract you from being able to pay attention, to learn. Uh, because people who are so sensitive oftentimes struggle with ADAD or ADHD, they are attending to the stimulation in their environment versus being able to attend to the deeper aspect. They also find, people with ADD find themselves escaping escaping more into these other dimensional places that you're calling or defining as, you know, different routes into different dimension levels. disorder. I call yeah, it. Yeah, different dimension. levels of reality, right? Different wow. levels of reality. And the way that I conceive of that is because it's something that's interesting. People who have ADD, their nervous systems are different and that they have a desire for interest, highly interested in different things, curiosity based and there is this feeling the subjective feeling within somebody who has ADD that that's a ceaseless ceaseless yearning and so when you're finding that escape route right from that being ultra sensitive you're finding those other places are more interesting to you that's how I conceive of it do you feel like that's how you feel when you're going into the different dimensions um I just know that when I was little, it was really hard to be uh, in school. Yeah. Because when every, all the other kids were focusing on equations and and the and the things that were important, I was reading them. I was reading the teacher. I was looking at the mm -hmm. emotions and the energy that I was feeling and pictures of what was going on in child abuse and in the teacher's romantic life and things like that. Consequently, it, because it ran like a fan that never turned off, I never got the gist of what everybody else caught on to because my focus was in a different direction. Right. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. Did what I say um, connect some dots for you, though, in terms of yes. the yes. attending, where you're attending your focus? So a lot of times people who have ADD are, are tuning <coughs> out, are tuning out of areas or subjects that are not interesting to them. They're just not interested in it. And so their attention is going to go into these other areas that they're more interested or curious about, which usually leads them to relationships or intuitive processes to receive information intuitively. The interesting thing about it is that ADD, while it can be a great gift in a number of ways, it can really be difficult. Great hell on Anybody, earth. anybody who has ADD will tell you that it's extremely difficult. It is to deal with and um you know and a, and a parent's nightmare a pair both of my parents were in professors and teachers so it was like an a nightmare for them yeah and the and the other additional piece is that people mostly come to me who have add and adhd because they're hyper focused and the hyper focus presents problems for them in their personal life which means they become so focused on what they're interested in and what they want to focus on, it becomes exclusionary to other people or to have fulfilling relationships. And so they usually are trying to find out how can I find those deeper relationships that I really are, want to have, even with their own children, but find it hard to connect. So hyper focus is a big way to delineate regular just attentional stuff that most people have and struggle with versus extreme ADD. 
you'll see people with the ADD who are on that extreme spectrum be able to hyper-focus in their area for, I mean, it's total immersion. They can get sucked in and be completely focused for Complete hours. Complete tunnel vision. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, so, it, um, so what about know, time drops away, they're not tracking, they're not attending to their personal relationships, and these kind of things become problematic. What do you think about autism? In, involved with that because when I had I, I just had my um, husband's niece come she can't speak and she can't um, at that time but the minute she got out of the car her fingers started wagging like antennas mm -hmm. and she walked in front of her and she was looking at all the trees walked up to the trees as if she was communicating. I cried. I was like, ah. Oh. I think that autism is, it, once again, another extreme of sensitivity. You can see it being expressed in different ways. Like ADD, any kind of learning disorder where you're talking about an expressive language difficulty, where you're talking about nonverbal intelligence in autistic folks, especially kids, they learn through uh, nonverbal means in a, in a sense. They have an ability to perceive through their environment patterns, communication styles, but are unable to express it. So when you're talking about true non-communicative autism where there's no language and you see children develop over the years and still have very limited language, maybe even just three or four words or even phrases being able to be developed, they're communicating with the world in other ways through a nonverbal right. intelligence. And so what you're seeing are the symbolic movements and gestures in the environment to express the uh, subjective personal experience that the child with autism is feeling internally. But because feelings and social um, cues and those kind of things are really, you know, part of the diagnostic picture on how doctors are able to tell kids have autism is through their ability to have that nonverbal intelligence, but also they're basically not picking up on social cues, right? Other people's feelings, how other people are communicating. So they're very internal. What I think about it in terms of sensitivity, right? And the umbrella of sensitivity is that kids who are autistic and on that extreme spectrum are so sensitive. I mean, sensitivity is really kind of how certain types of things or expressions are defined, right? You see them putting their their hands over the ears because screaming at colors. We go into Walmart and she got start screaming at a at a color that or a facial expression that she couldn't relate to. Right, and so because there's that there's that dysfunction, right, of social communication, it makes it much more difficult for us to communicate. And so it, it is really does fall on those systems that have been developed for communication to build like ABA and other forms of uh, communication development. So folks with autism can communicate with us and, and share with us what's going on. But it's difficult. It's extremely difficult. It's extre extremely difficult for the child, for the parents, for the family. Um, and so then, of course, there's the, that's why it's called the spectrum, right? There's different levels of sensitivity that affect the autism, autistic person, but I, I don't think we fully know. That's the answer to your question. I try to reserve judgment about autism and what it means, but there's a lot of different theories about it. I'm sure you know. Um, you know that I, I don't. I don't know that much about autism. I just know what I saw. Yeah. And well, it, and she's responding. She's responding. She's mentally. responding energetically to things, but not to people. Yeah. So it was so just, one of the things, I, yeah, one of the things I can add to that is I've consulted with doctors about it, many, from naturopathic to neurological doctors. And one, you, what you'll see is in the more naturopathic, right, holistic community, you'll hear doctors saying, well, uh, autistic children are less in their body, right? They're, they're going to the etheric realm more and they're less wow. embodied in their actual body. And so that's one hypothesis that I've heard from a naturopathic So doctor. how do you see that? What's that? So is that, well, see, this is what I'm having a hard time defining. I mean, I believe that that, you know, I'm, I'm seeing children these days that are more beautiful, 
more um, highly intuitive, more highly sensitive to the point of these children being almost dysfunctional. Yeah. Some. And, and so I'm wondering in the evolvement of, in the next stage of evolvement in children, <clears throat> are some of these children part of that, of that next level of evolvement or is that something else? I mean, I don't want to define it as, as a glitch it's of, of evolvement, but, um, I see what you're saying. I see where you're going. So the problem with autism diagnostically, okay, just scientifically is that they were not sure what it was in developmental childhood developmental psychology for a long time. Right. I mean, even in the nineties, you saw autism in the DSM four, then it became the DSM five and there were different levels of identification right so communication was a part of it social lack of social awareness was a part of it but um you're seeing it being diagnosed more now in psychiatry so we went from like one in 25 now to like one in 56 or one in 56 to one in 25 that was the big shift that happened in the last 10 years is where it was a much smaller proportion but now since it's grown because diagnostically psychiatrists and psychologists are more defined on what it is and more aware so that's the first part of the problem they didn't exactly look for it now they are and they have basic parameters and diagnostic criteria when you're talking about the etheric realm and you're talking about uh this growth could you could you explain the etheric realm i want to know what you mean courtney when you say that okay so there's always been the crossover between material reality individuals who are purely scientific when we're talking about medical stuff we're talking about diagnostic of of abnormal behavior okay right but when you're looking at things etherically through that lens which is what i'm thinking when you're describing to me this evolution that you're talking about you're talking more in terms of the etheric evolution of things. So in my worldview, etheric would be the crossover between regular perception, okay, perceiving through sight, sound, taste, touch, physiologically, okay, the five classic senses. Yeah. Then there's the etheric senses. And so the etheric senses came about through the spiritualist movement, through different types of understanding, clairsentience, clairaudience, clairknowing. Is that all seventh chakra? It's that not all. Some of it is located in the lower chakra of like survival okay. in the first, okay? And then it evolves okay. up through the okay. chakras in terms of the knowing and the sheaths and the koshas. I mean, it's involved, okay? But if you're looking at it in that sense, an etheric sense it's what is yoked within the physiological and what is yoked within the higher senses metaphysical sensory awareness that gives you perception from a higher perspective does everybody have it we don't know but it does seem to be that autistic children are somehow in touch with the etheric senses more which in an etheric worldview or perspective a affects their communication in ways that we don't understand but they do seem to be able to use those other senses more and a lot of times psychologists that are that are open or holistic to that worldview about the etheric believe that it's due to not a disability but due to some type of physiological injury when they were born or through virus or through some type of physiological dysfunction that allows those other senses to expand. It's like with any other injury and in brain injury or any other type of assault that happens is you'll see one part is weakened and then the brain tends to strengthen other areas of the brain to compensate. So there is some feeling right in that community it's not the regular medical community because this would be like speaking greek to them okay but i was going to say they would not respect this thinking at all would they and no because they don't no. necessarily even 
look at it this way. In the materialistic paradigm of medicine, when people survive death, and it's called a near-death experience, we know that experience happens because many people have experienced it. They describe a feeling of expansiveness. They describe a feeling of understanding that they go beyond their physical mind and body, right? Which the scientists say is lack of oxygen. And clinical death, no heartbeat, no brain activity, no electricity, you know, moving through EEG patterns in the brain, right? Right. So I'm comparing this and correlating to, to NDE because with autistic children, they do seem to have, be able to express through creativity, drawing, um, you know, like you're talking about with the gestures and getting excited about seeing the trees and so you're seeing as an observer, she's connected somehow to the trees, right? And the energetic or the images that she's seeing. What my book tries to do is straddle both those worlds, okay? Between a bridge between what we know is modernistic, materialistic science and show evidence of this other metaphysical reality with science that shows it exists. So sensitive people get validated. Autistic people have their own special abilities and this book is part of that. But do I go into all the reasons why? No, because we don't know. So I go okay. into some like theoretical ideas why um, but I don't say this is my opinion about autistic people. I describe a couple of autistic people who have talked about having uh, medical interventions, like John Ronson. He had trans uh, magnetic brain stimulation where they took the wand over his head. Oh, it was a Harvard medical study, and he had an emotional awakening that he talked about being uh, unfamiliar with the language of emotions even between his wife and people that are in his world and his work and when that emotional awakening happened he talks about it in really poignant ways like being able to feel his wife's depression being able to understand that people at times were making fun of him and he didn't necessarily recognize that before being autistic because he didn't understand the social cues or the social referencing of of jokes and people, you know, basically humiliating him and how painful that was to have that awareness. And so we know through individuals who have undergone these types of experimental studies, essentially to understand the autistic brain, their subjective experience is their world opens up in ways, right? To understand the language of emotions that they didn't understand before and how they can apply that. Now, John Ronson has written several books about his autism. And so we have to look to individuals like him who are describing it to us internally to try to understand what you're talking about, um, which could be maybe a more evolutionary effect. A lot of people don't believe that. They think that autism is a disorder. Dysfunction. They think it's a disorder and they think that it is, you know, uh, some people even believe it's a product of vaccines. And I mean, it gets into the real craziness of belief systems right around um these individuals in our society who are special right and what they bring to our society in ways that are pretty magnificent if we would just look and try to understand in different ways with different eyes everything is not just materialistic science so when you wrote this book you said there were four levels uh there's four types so the way that i conceive of it is i saw different patterns patterns emerging from sensitivity and they were basically like people who are a little farther out on the spectrum of sensitivity they have different types of abilities that they have developed and so i saw those kind of emerge in my 20 years of research so intuition was the first those are the individuals who basically make decisions they go from a to z without knowing how or why and they get the answer and they know it's right um, empaths are individuals who be are able to readily feel the feelings of other people in their own body in their own mind and body and not only that they can also discern other people's motivations and the tension is that empaths is that what you said or yes yes and then the third is uh visionaries visionaries are people that are able to you know use their visual field it's an it's a an imaginary field in front of their mind's eye an inner mind's eye where they are able to do use their spatial awareness spatial intelligence 
to look at images and look at them in three and four uh, dimensionally, turn them over, geometric shapes, mapping. I mean, there's a lot of different visual acuities that they use or visual giftedness that they use, but essentially what's underlying all of that is problem solving. Visionaries are looking at things in unique, unique ways visually, internally to solve problems. And so then the last one, would that be the one that the um, government was using for experimental working for them in wars and stuff, the visionary? So the program I think you're talking about was the CIA program that was developed right. down in Stanford at SRI or the Stanford Research Institute. And that was done through the Stargate program. Right. And the Stargate program was designed to test the remote perceptual ability of certain individuals that they targeted to be remote able to, yeah, to test their ability to sense remote objects, scenes, places, locations without anything and they also put them under sensory shielding to to shield them from any type of electromagnetic wave or effects and so what, mean, what is that what is that remote what is that electric shielding what is that that was all part of sri's study the government the cia and so it was yes it was during the cold war the end of the cold war they were trying to see silos and stuff in russia they were trying to look at submarines. I mean, some of these remote viewers were also doing other types of work that was interesting to them, like looking at different planets. I mean, it gets really wild, but yes. Would, were they called visionaries? No. But would I put the visionaries in that class of people who were able to use what they called remote perceptual awareness? Yes, because visionaries have the ability to call up in their visual field very easily anything it's usually yeah. from their imagination but the difference between the remote viewing project is that some people who had easier access to their imagination were not better remote viewers and the reason why is because when they set up the tests right what they called conscious overlay which is like your own personal experience your own imagination your power for analysis like rational thought that tends to confuse right the remote viewer when they're in that state and they're giving them the test between the location that they want them to remote view or see that became kind of difficult for some individuals that had that imaginative ability so when you're talking about visionaries yes they would apply in that field but they would be a certain type of visionary and then they would also have to hone their ability in a way that allowed them to not abstract, not use abstractions when they get perceived pictures. And then what they want, would want to do is immediately rationalize what that picture is. Where when they did the SRI experiments, they would give people locations and the better remote viewers were the ones that could basically just name what they saw and not try to interpret it. Do you see what I'm saying? I, I read an article on Laura Day She's the one that wrote the circle, the intuitive who wrote the circle, right? Um, she's, uh, well, Laura Day was the first one I ever read. She wrote this practical intuition. That's her. Yeah, she used to work as a, like a CEO in, uh, in the business and the corporate she world. She still is. And, and, she's, that. and she I've also. I've read a couple of her books. Yeah, I've read some of Laura for, Day's. Um, she works for Stott. Uh, the wealthy and predicting stock markets. She, it is her firm believer that men make better psychics than women, which I was kind of pissed off about That's because, true. because she that's said not true. categorically I, I false. Um, well, that's that's I kinda, would debate I, her on that, but I was what's mad. Her, what's her reason <laughs> and, behind it? Go ahead. Women are too emotional. Oh, that's and, her whole thing. That's and, her whole thing. She goes into the fact that if you can't get concrete results, it's because your emotions are involved. That's her whole thing. And so for her, men are better intuitives because they don't allow their emotions to get sidetracked into 
what's going on. Um, I'm women, sorry. I, I think that's it. a bias. I'm sorry. I, I, I think I, she's I think, being biased. I think actually what she said was not psychic. She said women make better intuitive psychics for problem solving for human nature, whereas men make better remote reviewer viewers and uh, the people that need more less emotional more pinpointing. I get one it. I get best, it. I'm not one of their best off. remote viewers. Look, one of their best remote viewers was a woman, and she was yeah, able to go. draw. She was an artist. She go. was able to depict her stuff that she remote viewed through drawing like no other man could through that study. Yeah. So I would double down with her. I mean, I want to know what exactly she's saying because I'm not. I understand what you're saying. But what has come down to the studies, the actual studies where they put men and women into these sample sizes to test, yes, different abilities came through, but they all split pretty equally along the lines between men and women. So she's got her theory, you know, I'm not saying that she's wrong, well, even, I'm just saying that she might be biased a little bit in how she's reading the data. She says that she's never been an emotional person. She's always been extremely intuitive, but she never was an emotional person. And so, um, but yet her greatest fan base is women. Um, and the woman that wrote the article on her was a little flabbergasted when she said that, that women, men make better, uh, in you know, I don't know how she I put almost it exactly. wonder if Laura Day also might be a little autistic. Did that ever come through to you when you were reading her stuff? Um, I What did she you think? Might be. When I read her she's she's more into she gives like in this book um, and I'm not trying to take away from your book, please. No, that's fine. I'm happy to talk about in, Laura Day. And I practical everybody it's practical it's everything has to be practical i know and here's the thing about her and i'm sorry maybe this is my own bias but something about her book when i read it um it didn't sit right with me it didn't sit right with me and i don't know why that was i don't know if it was the marketing i don't know if it was the marketing but some part of it seemed disingenuous to me as a reader and as a sensitive so i don't know what that is it was an impression that i had um Whereas I've read people like Teresa Caputo, I've read people like Kim Russo, I've read... What do you think of Teresa Caputo? Caputo. I mean, I've read everybody, right? And their methods and, and the way that they perceive intuition and in ways that are trying to be non-judgmental and accepting of all of it. And I guess the reason why Laura Day's stuff felt a bit inauthentic to me was she was being a bit judgy and categorizing things in a way that I felt was negative. And so when things get negative for me, I have a tendency wow, she to- come, Well, that makes sense because she comes, almost everybody in her family has committed suicide. Okay, so maybe she sees things through more of a negative slant in a world view. Yeah. I, I tried to resist I try to resist that, you know, that judgmental quality of negativity because I don't necessarily, I mean, I think that we are negative as a society and I think that there is a lot of negative judgmental stuff going on more now maybe than ever before. Um, but her work just didn't appeal to me. And so I guess as a reader, I was like, this is not, but when I talk about Teresa, um, I think I've read two or three of her books. The interesting thing that I like about Teresa is that she's authentic. She's straight up yes. honest. She talks about her struggles. She talks about dyslexia. She talks about the, 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 the perception that she doesn't want to receive negativity. She talks about going to the Heiner Channel. She talks about the symbolic language that she developed with Pat Longo. I mean, those kind of things to me are more refreshing because they're trying to illuminate for others how to do it yourself. Whereas with Laura Day, I understand it's practical, but maybe in that practicality, something was getting lost in translation for me. Yeah, just, you know? I just wanted to bring up the man woman thing and ask you what you thought about that because I was they a don't little flabbergasted. Necessarily know. Yeah, they don't necessarily know exactly how intuitive abilities fall along the lines of what proportion are men and what proportion of women. They know right. that women and men 
are both intuitive so it doesn't happen with more women than it does with men although a lot of people think that and I often find that people um, men who have resisted that urge when they finally kind of adopt it and accept it and see it they're very intuitive when they finally recognize I, 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 I would agree because um, my husband when I one of the things I said I read once is if you want to teach a man how to be a psych how to be intuitive and psychic let him live with an intuitive psychic because he'll find that everything about things don't make sense anymore the logical doesn't always make sense that's why anymore. they call us crazy <laughs> <laughs> the other so, thing i wanted to mention too before you move on is when they did the sri studies okay that's what they that's one of the things that they did they they thought well let's try to see if we can do stock market projections and they did they predicted successfully three or four stock market projections in a row made money and so what laura day is saying is true i mean they did that study they don't focus on it in the sri materials when you read all the journal studies around it but the other interesting thing to know is that they did use men and women in that study but the, primarily it was men at first before they started to incorporate women because they feel that they're more what do you call it? I, I don't, don't know. know. It was mostly military personnel, and and you know, so when you're talking, is, when you're yeah. talking about the CIA and the military and the funding, and who they selected, I mean, there was another study that was done at Stanford recently here, Dr. Gary Nolan, who I interviewed for the book to talk about these intuitive people and and their study, their new study, they called them highly intuitive people. They studied about 100 people. They were split between 60 men, 40 women, so more men in that sample size. And they found that these intuitive individuals had actually neuroanatomical changes, right? They were different. And that was one of the newest studies that has never been done before, also CIA funded through the life sciences. You know, I mean, the thing that's interesting about the CIA funding is that they are specifically targeting certain things. You can tell when you look at the studies what they're targeting, which is that remote perceptual ability. Now they've taken it further and have found an actual neurological area in the brain that's um, different from other people who are not as intuitive. And so it makes sense to me. Well, science is showing us that, you know, what we've known for a long time is that we're different. They don't know why that neurological difference is there. They want to probably study that more, but, you know, they'll need more money. And that, that study hasn't even been published yet. In, well, you know, I in, thought they got away from it. it. Did they get away? Did they find it was too inconsistent and they got away from it or something like That's that? That's the telepathic part of it that they felt over time has been inconsistent from earlier studies. Like Stanley Krippner did a study at Mammonides over in the East Coast where he did dream telepathy. And that study was like the preeminent study about dream like telepathy. Like John Casey type stuff, right? I, uh, Casey and Casey stuff is a whole different branch of it. But yes, para parapsychological it? studies, parapsychological studies are a whole field. And Stanley Krippner is one type of dream telepathy. He had these people go into the dream states. They showed that dream telepathy was possible between a target and the people that they were, uh, you know, having undergoing the dream telepathy sample. But what do you it mean? Wasn't, well, I, it wasn't no, could you explain that? Could you explain it with the target? What do you mean? One person was dreaming. One person was awake. People who were going undergoing the dreams were basically um, given like a protocol during the dream states to make telepathic contact with the people that weren't in dream states. Okay. Okay. That was done like what you're talking about in that era of SRI research when they were in the seventies, trying to figure this stuff out and telepathy mainly and how telepathy works through extrasensory perception or, you know, what means is it possible? Right. So over that time period, Stanley Krippner's work, came out, it was published, it was an actual academic study, people got excited about it because it's like, okay, dream te telepathy is possible. But nobody else was able to replicate the study in any other academic setting of people who tried to replicate Stanley Krippner's work. So that's where you hear that 
what I'm thinking, what you're saying is that inconsistency of trying to prove it between different that, studies. I just something about red, yeah, once. So but they got away from it. Yeah, but there they, was, they, there was they a movie. Did get, they never did get away from it. They kept going. The CIA did. One of, one of my favorite movies was an Anthony Hopkins movie called Heart. Yeah, and that was a, a good and one. I and and it had a terrible review, but I, know. I always thought it was it was it, to me it was like oh my god you know that really hit. But well, he has um, he's so interesting because he has dyslexia. And when Does you start to, when you start to look at a lot of the intuitives that are famous, like Teresa Caputo or Conchetta Bertoldi, uh, she's the one that wrote the book. Um, do the dead pe do dead people watch me in my shower? Do dead people walk their dogs? Right? Because she's communicating with afterlife personalities. They have dyslexia. Okay. It's a commonality huh. that most people don't know that I found in my research. And so when you start to dig down into this more intuitive mode. Why do some people who have dyslexia become famous for their intuitive ability? Anthony Hopkins did a movie called Slipstream, where Slipstream kind of went into his theory of life and he expounds upon his own type of perception. Now, the movie is difficult to understand, but you get into the window of a, and a dyslexic person's mind as he's conceiving of the world. And Steven Spielberg funded it. Right. Steven Spielberg also has dyslexia. I mean, when you start to look into the number of people in the entertainment industry, in the movie industry, Brian Grazer, right? Famous dyslexia. You start to notice a pattern of individuals who see the world in a certain way that have difficulty with reading or language. And why is that? My feeling is that they're able to rely and have learned to trust their intuition more in terms of their emotions or how they follow things or how they perceive the world. So it's still unknown why dyslexia allows this type of magnificent intuition to be realized through their own perception, but it's an effect. So Anthony Hopkins is a person that also has dyslexia, who I would consider extremely intuitive. And then extremely intelligent, I believe, too. Right. So he may have made movie choices that you can go and look at over the course of his life, like Hearts. Which are almost all successful. I think it was Hearts in Atlantis. Was it Hearts in Atlantis? It, maybe it was. Where he's, all I know, he he's was having a, premonitions and there's a little boy and a mom. He, got, he has temporal lobe epilepsy where he goes into this stare. And when he goes into the temporal lobe epilepsy stare, mm -hmm. um, he sees Maybe things, he sees movie. premonitions. And little boy, you like you said, um, gets close to him. He's running away from the FBI tests. They want him. They need these these temporal lobe epilepsy uh, trances he goes into to see things, well, which is I thought another thing that you that I noticed. Um, Temporal lobe epilepsy is also considered to be something that is also connected with visionary, intuitive stuff. But I have not heard anybody say that much. Well, the reason why is because with temporal lobe epilepsy, you're talking about the temporal lobe. And so temporal means time, space, right? And so people who have temporal lobe epilepsy are affected by the, um, you know, the epileptic seizure, but then what happens after the seizure, right? The the um, the disruption or the inhibition is this feeling and quality of fusion, okay, between perception, right, perceptual awareness and feeling, perception and feeling fused together, and they create these states of um, in an, in ordinary states of time being somewhere else, everything kind of coming together, the magnificence of colors, right? And seeing those things and feeling all in company. I have temporal lobe epilepsy. So you know, so you know. I had, I had an accident when I, was in, when I was in first grade and fell down an elevator shaft on the back of my head. So you know. And after, and after that, I started to see things. I started to feel things. I would go on walks and I would actually see visions and I would come home and tell my parents and they'd say, you're telling us stories again, you know, but to Aww. me, I embrace them as real. So, yeah, it's totally, it's totally connected. 
It's Good. totally it's totally connected because the temporal lobe is the area in uh, neurologically where we track time, we form memories, we have the emotions and the feelings. And so temporal lobe ep epilepsy has a way of fusing perceptual awareness and feeling together. That's the short version. But we could talk about it more if you want because there's nope, all nope, I'm fine. Well, there's all I kinds of research to validate what you're experiencing and I try to advocate for that for people because a lot of times people don't understand it. And it's important to be validated in your experience. Yeah. So let me see where um we're looking at 308 right here and so we're um, over we're over our time. Any other questions? That's okay. <laughs> Where can we get your book and your website? You can find where it. Where can they reach? You can find it by searching for Gifts of the Highly Sensitive. Look for your local store. Sometimes it'll be at Target or Walmart. You know, you might get lucky that way. If they don't have it at those big box stores, just ask them and they can get it. But if you want to get it, if you're a subscriber of other mail Amazon. services, yes, or Barnes and Noble books um you can find it there any any of those locations you might even be able to find it now at your local library because some local libraries are getting it in so hopefully people will be able to get it without having to purchase it at their library well courtney you are a very smart lady and i love talking to you <laughs> <laughs> it's so interesting where we went we went from uh, autism into dyslexia into temporal i don't even know what to title this anymore <laughs> i mean i think it's it's specialness right it's using yeah. your specialness and 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 using your specialness in a way that is important and that matters right right well thank you baby girl and i sure appreciated every moment with you you're okay. welcome thanks for having me and i look forward to talking with you again sometime soon I hope we did record this. I don't remember that I even, did we hear a voice? I did, and I even said, accept, record, so I know you pressed oh, it. Oh, good, I'm glad. I thought, if I didn't take this, I'm gonna go insane. Okay, we so. We did, and oh, there's good. a lot of valuable stuff in there. I mean, we went into SRI and the Cold War, and there's a lot of good information. So make sure that you save it. It's gonna, I will. it's gonna save even if you turn it off without stopping the recording, just so you know. Okay. All right, Courtney. Thanks, Thank you, babe. Take care. Talk bye. -bye. To you later. bye.